Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Solaris. Um, Dr. Solaris is a professor at uh, Emory University and one of the gurus in anterior and lateral skull based surgery. Um, I, as residents um, at Emory, um, uh, we just saw uh, a ton, for lack of better words, uh, of temporal bone cancer uh, and everything ranging from lateral temporal bone resection to subtotal temporal bone resection done with Dr. Slaris. So uh, really fortunate to have him. Um, again, like all Neurotology Eastern Region virtual education lectures, this will be recorded and posted on YouTube. Um, so uh, can feel free to watch it after hours also. Dr. Slaris, thanks again, and uh, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you, Mallory. It's, a, it's always a pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me. And I just want to share our experience with temporal bone malignancies. I think it's a topic that uh, is certainly not common in all places. And uh, it's something that uh, we have been blessed to have quite a bit of volume on. And uh, so I'll share my thoughts with you over the next 40 or 45 minutes or so. Um, I think when we look at uh, cancer of the temporal bone, the, um, those cases that are primary temporal bone cancers are actually very rare. It's about 200 cases or so per year in the United States. But most of what we see is extensions to the temporal bone, and these can be skin cancers such as squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma that start in the conchal skin and then migrate into the temporal bone. And um, those tumors that uh, spread contiguously, uh, primarily from the parotid, and uh, certainly metastatic tumors can be seen as well. The uh, most common primary tumor is squamous cell carcinoma, which arises in the external auditory canal, largely from inflammation, and then from the middle ear and mastoid, we can see adenocarcinomas as well. So the presentation will uh, really be a vague thing. So otalgia is probably the most common complaint that uh, you will see for a lot of uh, primary ear problems. So it is not uh, something that is easy to differentiate. And uh, otorrhea and hearing loss are also very, very common. So the ones that would lead you to think that you're dealing with a cancer rather than just a uh, infection, uh, such as cranial nerve deficits, uh, facial palsy specifically, uh, and uh, a mass in the external auditory canal or a parotid mass from uh, metastatic disease uh, are a little slower, lower in numbers. And so that's why many times we will have patients that have uh, uh, ear pain or otorrhea for quite some time before they present to us uh, for uh, evaluation. And this is why in many cases, these tumors can present uh, far more advanced than they need to be. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Moody and Antonio that was published a while ago, but it's still a very relevant um, in what uh, tumors in the external auditory canal can, uh, you know, extend laterally. And in this case, they become apparent very, very early, but oftentimes they'll migrate through the, uh, the skin and through the cartilage um, and extend uh, underneath the skin and underneath the uh, muscles and uh, penetrate this way. And they can also go in uh, at that uh, bony cartilaginous junction uh, uh, through the fissures here and into the parapharyngeal space. And many, many times um, we can see tumors that are uh, quite advanced because they haven't really uh, had a lot of uh, external extension. And so in patients who don't have a great access to healthcare, uh, they will just ignore these problems and present with advanced tumors. It is not very common that the tumor actually invades the um, tympanic membrane and extend into the middle ear. Uh, and this is sort of a delay uh, effect of the tumor. And this is why in the vast majority of cases, uh, a lateral temporal bone resection is still 
uh, good workhorse in this case. Uh, tumors when they extend medially uh, through the through the uh, TM into the middle ear, then they can travel uh, into the mastoid air cells and they can travel through the eustachian tube and along the carotid canal as well. Um, so when we see these patients, the workup is uh, a standard workup for most head and neck cancers. A high resolution uh, CT to look for bony erosion and this will uh, help us with the staging. Uh, a soft tissue uh, uh, CT of the neck to look for lymph node metastases. Uh, the MRI is very, very useful to look at the soft tissues and the neurovascular structures and certainly a metastatic workup uh, to determine um, whether uh, patients uh, are still uh, candidates for surgical resection in the absence of metastatic disease. Carotid angiography is used selectively in those tumors that will uh, have some level of carotid involvement um, to determine uh, uh, if, in the case of a potential carotid accident, uh, there's possibility of uh, carotid sacrifice. And certainly, um, audiometry is useful uh, not only for um, understanding what level of uh, residual hearing we have, but potential for rehabilitation with bone anchor hearing aids uh, in the future. The use of bone anchor here in AIDS, just as a side note, um, can be challenging sometimes because even though some patients are candidates for it, um, the uh, radiation used in the postoperative setting uh, can make um, implantation uh, difficult and challenging. Um, nowadays, with the use of bands, and I don't do the rehabilitation, but uh, my uh, neurotology colleagues that do. Uh, there's newer options with bands, headbands, and other options that you guys probably know better than me are, are sometimes helpful in these patients. The staging, uh, it's, um, it's, this is the Pittsburgh staging, which is only uh, for tumors of the external auditory canal. It, it is not a widely accepted uh, staging, uh, but it's the best we have currently. For most of my practice, which are tumors extending to the temporal bone, they're technically all T4s. But it, this staging uh, is uh, for tumors of the external auditory canal, and they base on uh, bony erosion. Uh, suffice it to say that T1 and T2 tumors have uh, limited or no bony erosion, and they do very, very well. Uh, and tumors, uh, T3s, uh, basically erode the uh, entire external auditory canal. And then T4s are those that extend into the otic capsule or um, um, uh, extend intracranially as well and into the stylomastic frame. So when we have uh, evidence of facial paralysis, by definition, they're all gonna be T4. Um, the other uh, aspects of it is when you have uh, involvement of the temporal mandibular joint. Those are also T4, uh, and they all extend into the uh, infratemporal fossa as well. So <clears throat> the, the uh, primary therapy for all these tumors uh, is surgery in those patients that are fit to undergo surgery. And I think this is really important. Primary radiation is uh, ineffective uh, but in the postoperative setting, radiation therapy is given to those with T3 and T4 tumors. And certainly the management of the neck involves surgery and radiation therapy to the neck in those patients who have uh, nodal positive disease. Uh, radiation and chemotherapy combined um, is only palliative. And uh, the procedures that we are going to discuss are subtotal temporal bone resection, lateral temporal bone resection. The sleeve resection I mentioned here, and this should only be used as a margin in those patients that have a junctional conchal ball tumor that um, minimally extends into the external auditory canal, and it should not really be a treatment of the external auditory canal tumors um, because uh, it's not oncologically sound in this, in this setting. 
certainly for a lot of these tumors, particularly in our practice where most of the tumors are extensions to the temporal bone, there are several adjunct procedures that need to be performed in addition to the resection, the tumor resection itself, such as parotidectomy, infratemporal fossa dissections, uh, craniotomies, et cetera. So when we talk about the extent of resection, I mentioned the workhorse for us is the lateral temporal bone resection. Um, in, in our, in our uh, practice, we have maybe uh, 40 or 50 of these cases per year. This involves an M-block resection of the external auditory canal and bone with the, um, with the TM intact. And um, we'll show you how that looks like. Uh, in many cases, this involves resection of skin, parotid, partial uh, mandibulectomy, et cetera, as the tumor dictates. And then we have the subtotal temporal bone resection, which is the resection of the, uh, um, the uh, Petrus pyramid uh, with sparing of the carotid canal, essentially. And then the total temporal bone resection, which uh, we don't perform um, because the prognosis is so poor when you have to sacrifice the carotid. Incisions vary. Uh, Postauricular incision is very useful in many cases, although the incision will be dictated largely by whether there is skin involvement, and in those cases, we will adjust our incision to also resect this, uh, the skin involvement of the given tumor. Uh, for the lateral temporal bone resection, and this is uh, just a stepwise approach to it, obviously, the first step is to perform a wide cortical mastoidectomy with identification of the tegment and the sinus. Posteriorly, uh, identification of the facial nerve and the labyrinthine block. And then we have to do an extended um, facial recess approach or posterior tympanotomy, uh, extending anteriorly into the epitympanum uh, um, and inferiorly into the hypotympanum. And it's important that you're gonna transect your corded tympany in order to really extend widely into that hypotympanum and perform your osteotomy to separate the styloid process from the external auditory canal and be able to outfracture the, the uh, external auditory canal and avoid a carotid injury. So although the picture here shows uh, chisel, I would caution you to avoid using chisels uh, to perform your osteotomies. We use the chisel more as a, a small lever to um, fully release the bone and outfracture it. And once you use it to outfracture, you can uh, do additional drilling in the small space uh, to separate your carotid uh, from uh, your bone specimen. So here is an example. Uh, this patient had a uh, conchal bowl uh, basal cell carcinoma, you can see uh, you perform your parotidectomy and your incision is largely dictated by the skin involvement that extended into the ear. And here it's just showing the parotidectomy part and this is the main trunk here. And now we have here, this is your specimen involving part of the concha and the skin. We have our, uh, our um, mastoidectomy here and this is your um, epitympanum and this is posterior, this is a left ear, and then we're out fracturing uh, the ear canal in, uh, with bone along with the specimen. And here you have the completed resection. You, this was reconstructed with a simple uh, temporalis rotational flap. As you can see, there's hollowing here in a skin graft, and you can see uh, the completion of the resection. This is uh, another patient. Uh, this is a, a lesion that's uh, on the right side. You can see the, there's some dural enhancement and you, you have your mass involving part of the pinna and extending into the external auditory canal and the TMJ. So this patient is gonna require a um, resection of the external auditory canal with part of the um, the tegment tympany and the dura and uh, resection of all that skin involved. So here you have the lesion. You can see 
uh, the pinna is involved. There's uh, involvement of the uh, skin and the parotid deep. And here we have the specimen. We've outlined the lesion with a wide margin of skin and pinna. We have uh, here uh, the lesion now attached to the middle fossa and the dura. And you have uh, at the completion of the resection, the resection of the dura, the um, lateral temporal bone resection, the TMJ, and a radical parotidectomy. And you have your neck dissection. Here you can see the jugular vein and your cranial nerve 11. So we try to remove these lesions and block as best possible. It is the best option to assess margin um, accuracy, uh, margins with accuracy. Um, there is no um, oncologic downfall when you resect this tumors piecemeal, but it does become a big headache to try to determine um, the margin status when you have so many different areas where your margins could be involved. And so here you can see that specimen, you have the dura, and we've inked the dural uh, edges for best assessment. You have your entire uh, lateral temporal bone and your TM and your malleus here, you can see it uh, all in block. And this is uh, um, part of your TMJ right here, just anterior. And like I said, the, this is the middle fossa dura and, and the middle fossa floor resected. Here's just another example, uh, similar uh, concept. Uh, this is a right ear and this is the posterior skin uh, that was involved with this tumor, the parotid is anterior. And then you can see here the TMJ um, and then the, uh, the, the lateral uh, temporal bone resection with the TM in view. Here's a left ear defect. You can see um, the mandible resected. This is the, the tegment uh, and the, uh, the sigmoid and then the whole defect right here. Uh, this patient, um, was a very advanced age patient that showed up with a neglected um, parotid mass that extended to the temporal bone and initially presented with a parotid mass that was treated with radiation alone uh, because the they patient was deemed unresectable by the surgeon that saw him initially. Um, and then the area of ulceration just kept growing and was treated for several months with um, antibiotics and dressing changes. And this case I just show to demonstrate that radiation therapy will not cure these patients. And if the patient is a surgical candidate, should undergo surgical resection. Um, unfortunately, this patient kept deteriorating uh, this went on for about a year and a half until the patient came to us much more debilitated, but we still felt that surgical resection was the best option for him. And that's what we did. And here is just a complete resection. You have uh, the defect, the, the mandible, and this was just reconstructed with a uh, anterolateral flap and, and the patient was, went home um, uh, without any complications. So here we have just a quick video of how we uh, perform this. It's once we've done the cortical mastoid, then we are going to identify your, your facial nerve. And I don't here. Uh, here's the facial nerve. Here's the corda. You have uh, your epitympanum open here, and you have your um, incus right here. Um, and now we uh, proceed to perform our extended um, facial recess approach or posterior tympanotomy to really get um, uh, around this, this defect. You can see here the epitympanum is completely drilled out all the way to uh, the uh, temporal mandibular joint. And now we um, continue to drill in the hypotympanum inferiorly. And you have to be able to, uh, you have to be careful, excuse me, to uh, perform constant irrigation. and be careful to watch the shaft of your drill uh, to avoid heating that nerve. So now you continue to drill inferiorly in order to separate uh, the, 
the cylinder from the um, from the um, the rest of the patient. And now you remove the anchors, uh, and you have to also transect the tendon in order to not avulse the um, in, in order to not avulse the TM. And once you transect the tendon and uh, you are happy with your osteotomies, then you can uh, out fracture the specimen. So now here we just out fracture the specimen, and then uh, you know you get back to one of those other pictures I already showed. For the subtotal temporal bone resection, that's a different approach where we're going to go around the entire temporal bone in order to remove it. Again, various incisions. I don't particularly like the Y incision, but most of my patients are going to have a combination for either post-auricular or pre-auricular with skin, depending on the level of skin involvement. But the subtotal temporal bone resection, uh, the goal is to resect the entire uh, 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 pyramid and block. And so we're going to go around it through a middle fossa craniotomy and through a uh, 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 sorry uh, retromastoid craniectomy with um, unroofing of the sigmoid sinus and mobilization of the sinus if the sinus can be spared or occlusion of the sinus if it cannot be spared. And then the goal is uh, to then uh, mobilize the carotid and then perform an osteotomy at the petrous apex to remove the, the entire specimen. And the defect is going to be something like this, where you have your uh, dura exposed and then the entire uh, pyramid uh, resected. Obviously, the facial nerve has to be sacrificed and then we preserve the carotid um, in, uh, in all cases. Uh, we don't uh, feel that carotid sacrifice has a great prognosis. So here's uh, just a view of a, of a skull. Um, and then this is essentially what we want to resect. This is the area of bone that we want to resect along the middle fossa. We're going to make our osteotomies uh, just around uh, foramen ovale and along the, um, the um, inferior petrosal sinus along the sigmoid sinus and along the uh, middle fossa floor. Here's a, a cadaveric dissection. Uh, in this particular case, there's a, a posterior C incision, very extended. And then you can see all the different anatomy. You have your uh, very familiar anatomy, your external auditory canal. You have here your uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle, and then your parotid gland in the zygomatic arch. Once we um, do further dissection, uh, we can uh, dissect the parotid, and then we have our facial nerve, which uh, will be sacrificed in this particular case. And then we can have access to our entire uh, temporal bone. Uh, many cases, it's very helpful to remove at least part of the uh, uh, ramus in order to gain access to the carotid canal, just anterior to the external auditory canal. Um, and here you can see uh, the angle of the mandible, the zygoma. And once we remove part of this, then we can visualize here. The, here's the external auditory canal. We follow the carotid from the neck up, and then you can uh, drill along the carotid canal uh, by removing the um, part of the mandible, and then you can visualize that carotid canal, then you can mobilize the carotid completely. And this will allow us to then make our osteotomies just posterior to the carotid and mobilize the, 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 the bone that way. So here we have uh, just that view again. We have the, the carotid completely mobilized from below, and then we have B3 uh, looking from the middle fossa, and then we can make our osteotomy into that uh, infratemporal fossa from above. And then, uh, and you can see it here as well, how we can do that osteotomy and then fracture the bone down. So this is how uh, the specimen looks. 
Uh, here's from outside, we have the zygomatic arch, which also has to be osteotomized. The glenoid fossa and are caught just uh, around the glenoid fossa. And you can also see from the uh, cranial side how you can see the internal auditory canal. And here's the petrous ridge and then the osteotomy is along that way as well. So here's an example, um, intraoperative view. You have your middle fossa craniac craniotomy, um, and we have the specimen all mobilized here and down fractured. And here's at the completion of the resection, you have your entire neck dissection. Here's your 12th nerve. The uh, mandible uh, has been removed here. You have your uh, jugular vein, cranial nerve 11, and then your carotid. Here's your first gen of the carotid, and here is the carotid turning horizontally. And this is uh, the defect that can then be reconstructed with a free flap. Here's an example of a um, recurrent uh, middle ear tumor. This patient actually was very interesting. He presented uh, with a, I don't know if you can appreciate here, but he presented to uh, me two years prior to this with a adenocarcinoma of the paranasal sinuses in, involving the anterior cranial base. He underwent a craniofacial resection endoscopically with resection of dura um, and intradural dissection for that. At the time, we uh, saw that there was some opacification of the middle ear, but there was no abnormal enhancement in the middle ear space um, from uh, an additional tumor. So I suspect that it was very early on in the middle ear space. Uh, and we assume that all the opacification was related to his eustachian tube dysfunction from the sinonasal tumor. But on follow-up, it grew significantly. Um, and so he went on for a total temporal bone resection. Here we have his intraoperative pictures, uh, and I'll show you the video in just a minute, but just for orientation, uh, we have the TMJ right here, uh, the carotid canal, the external auditory canal, and then we have our uh, sigmoid sinus on roof, the middle fossa here. Here's my glove, and then uh, we have the uh, internal jugular vein, external auditory canal, and we're drilling the carotid canal here, and here's your osteotomy for the middle fossa. Now here you'll see, and I'll show you the video, like I said in a minute, here's the carotid completely mobilized. Um, and then from the middle fossa, we uh, transect the internal auditory canal contents and then uh, mobilize and remove the tumor and block. So here we have intraoperatively, the view from the middle fossa here is your middle meningeal artery. And uh, we're just visualizing here. I'm going to move forward a little bit. And now uh, here's the, the entire middle fossa exposed. And then, uh, and then the, the temporal lobe retracted. So here we corroborate with the Doppler and we have uh, we start by unroofing our sigmoid sinus, something that's standard to, um, I don't know what happened there, but uh, so we unroof the sigmoid sinus and we'll follow it all the way into the jugular uh, fossa. So here we uh, just follow the sigmoid uh, all the way to uh, the jugular ball. Um, in, uh, in order to mobilize the bone just superior to it in an extradural fashion. The vast majority of these uh, resections can, uh, are extradural, although obviously sometimes there's uh, dural resections that are necessary. Uh, overt intra intracranial and uh, bone, uh, brain parenchymal invasion is uh, in most cases, a, contra a relative contraindication to resection. We uh, don't advocate for uh, extensive uh, brain resections in most of these tumors as the prognosis is very poor. 
Now here we move anteriorly and we're drilling the carotid canal. Uh, we have our middle fossa osteotomy here and we're following the carotid all the way up in order to mobilize the carotid from uh, the specimen. So now you have the carotid here and we, uh, we're we uh, cleaning out uh, the carotid canal in, uh, in order to then move the carotid out of the way and be able to, uh, to protect it. So now we uh, address the, uh, the tumor and we drill along the petrous apex in order to, um, to be able to uh, outfracture the tumor. The contents of the um, internal auditory canal can be now transected. Um, and um, in, um, the rest of the specimen is mobilized again in an extradural fashion and uh, various uh, dural attachments can be, uh, can be uh, transected. And now uh, here the, the rest of the specimen comes out. So you can have, you have the sigmoid here, jugular bulb, and then the specimen is completely resected and blocked. Now you have here your carotid and then your entire temporal bone specimen. And here uh, there's a, a little dural patch for the uh, area where the internal artery canal used to be. So now let's talk a little bit about numbers. Uh, in the past, I would say 50 to 70 years, the survival for cancers involved in the temporal bone has increased significantly. Most seriouses will now report T1 and T2 tumors have 80 to 100% survival. There is a, still a controversy with regarding uh, advanced malignancies of the temporal bone. And obviously, as I showed you, I have a bias for envelope resection of uh, uh, tumors that extend into the middle ear space. But there's certainly a, a controversy and some people advocate for a radical drill out, a subtotal putrosectomy uh, in a drill out fashion. Uh, and the literature in this regard is sparse, so um, there's uh, very few people with large series of total temporal bone resections comparing the outcomes of the two. Uh, and certainly even in our, in our experience, um, these operations are not very common. So, um, you know, we probably perform um, a two or three total temporal bones in a year, so that's, you know, in the last review, roughly 12 or 13 cases. Um, but um, I think that the benefits of an in-block resection are that the margin assessment is much easier than when um, one does a, a radical drill out. Uh, we can assess the margins not only of the soft tissues, but also of the bone after decalcification. And, um, and, and that certainly has uh, oncologic implications. So to look at some of our numbers, um, um, here you can see um, in all cases, uh, the uh, survival goes uh, down after, um, after uh, over time, uh, in our uh, five-year uh, disease-free survival is about 66%. Uh, but when we separate them by uh, staging, uh, obviously T1s and T2s um, do uh, much better than those that are T3s and T4s. And the T3s and T4s uh, are uh, roughly about 48% at five years. So um, that is... Um, that is certainly uh, part of the disease process, and that's why uh, the management of this disease can be challenging. Um, but the reason we have continued to advocate for in block resections is because it is very critical to determine margin positivity, as you can see in this, uh, in this graph, that positive margins have a way worse prognosis than when you have clear margins. 
Uh, and this is ir irrespective of the disease stage. Those patients who have negative margin, who have, excuse me, positive margins, um, do much worse than those who have negative margins. So I think it is very, very important for us to have a good idea of what our margin status is going to be. Uh, in, in latter years, we have added chemotherapy to, to those patients who have positive margins in, in an effort to improve outcomes. But as of now, it's still a very, very important predictive, predictor of poor outcome. Um, and then um, you can see here uh, that um, the survival probability for those patients who have more aggressive disease is obviously lower. Uh, in uh, those patients that have uh, a facial nerve dysfunction at the time of presentation uh, are an index of much more aggressive disease. And so uh, when we have patients with uh, facial nerve palsy in uh, tumors that involve the temporal bone uh, that are primary, we know that the, uh, the facial nerve function, that, that their prognosis is much worse. Um, just to summarize, I think uh, we've touched on a topic of tumors that are uh, very rare. Um, but in our practice, we have a large uh, number of patients that show up with contiguous spread to the temporal bone, and that's the most common uh, form of temporal bone involvement. Uh, I think that all patients who are fit for surgery should undergo surgery, uh, and radiation therapy should be used in the postoperative setting only in a curative fashion. Negative margins are the major predictor of, of survival and disease control, and therefore uh, every attempt should be made to achieve negative margins. And then um, the most important thing uh, to keep in mind is there's still some controversies uh, of whether an M block resection or a radical drill out are equivalent. I have the personal bias to. Uh, attempt an M-block resection whenever possible, uh, but certainly don't have enough numbers to prove that it's better than a radical drill out. In general, in our practice, um, we do attempt a resection of dural involvement, but gross temporal, temporal lobe involvement um, in, in, in most of our patients is considered unresectable, and the prognosis is very, very poor in this setting. Lastly, um, we will hopefully be hosting uh, the North American Skull Base Society meeting in person in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, Danny Prevedella and myself are the co-chairs for the surgical, pro for the, not the, for the entire program, and we would love to see you there. Um, Phoenix in February is a great, great place, great weather, uh, so would like to invite you all and hopefully you'll consider coming. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Solaris. That was awesome. Um, we'll open it up for any questions right now. Hey, thanks, Dr. Solaris. This is Michael. I'm one of the ENT residents here at MUSC. Um, understanding that most of these patients um, are going to get at least uh, postoperative radiation. Um, in the setting of a CSF leak, uh, how do you approach uh, reconstruction for most of these? Um, so the vast majority of our patients nowadays just get get a free flap. Now the question uh, if the if the leak persists, uh, I suspect your question is whether the leak uh, that persists after you know your standard you know seven to ten days of healing what to do with radiation and whether to delay it or, and uh, is that, am I understanding it correctly? That, that was kind of my follow-up question. We've had a couple of these where uh, they get a free flap and uh, they'll have like a persistent leak um, and then they end up getting delayed treatments and it, it seems like it's always a, a what should we do uh, with regards 
to their adjuvant care versus going back in and trying to repair the leak? Yeah, so yeah, so I think that well, the number one is I won't radiate an active leak. So that's you know that's just a, a, the first thing. And then in terms of uh, I think in general we try to do early revisions of these problems because. Uh, most of them will not heal on their own. I think that the uh, the thought that if you can pop a drain and just allow them to heal, it really never works. Uh, because most of them don't have extensive uh, uh, dural defects that warrant the leak and there's other reasons why they leak. Uh, and so I think that early revision is ideal. But the other thing that uh, we have to keep in mind, and you know, I did a lot of this, uh, my own repairs initially, but now I rely on other um, surgeons to do their repairs. And while free flap surgeons are very, very good at having free flap survive, they uh, tend to not always understand the concepts of, you know, proper dural closure and things like that. So it's very, very important to have good communication between the resecting surgeon and the free flap surgeon on those aspects that relate to the dura and closing the dead space. Most of the times when we have leaks is because there's not enough uh, soft tissue filling the dead space within the mastoid cavity. And so there's a lot of air. And so the dura, although it's been repaired, it floats in the breeze, so to speak. And so that um, that dead space is not properly closed and that then leads to a CSF leak. Awesome, thank you. I was gonna ask a very similar question, um, but I have a follow-up and, and this is more because I have some insider info, but can you talk a little bit about um, how you use the exoscope for these cases and benefits over the microscope and maybe just tell us, because I don't think that's a tool that's, um, at least at our institution, it's not widely used and perhaps the same thing at others. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as you know, because we did the review, but uh, um, it's been now, what, I think six years uh, that I moved from microscopic uh, visualization to exoscopic visualization uh, for these cases with rare exceptions. And I think that um, I did it for several reasons. As you see in some of these defects, you are operating between a highly magnified field when you have to do the drill out and then you move on to say do a neck dissection and it doesn't always work to where you can do it sequentially in a perfect fashion. Sometimes we have to drill it but then we have to mobilize soft tissue and then go back to drilling a little bit more. Uh, and so um, it is uh, very cumbersome to have a large uh, machine that occupies a big portion of your footprint uh, in the operating room. So we've used the exoscope, which is has a much smaller footprint, and then we can easily go from magnification to um, to uh, regular uh, visualization with loops or what have you. Uh, so that's uh, what we've done in the past uh, six years. And what we've noticed is um, that the uh, efficiency of the operation has been uh, significantly improved. Um, in my um, uh, experience, I think we've reduced uh, the operative time by at least 40%. Uh, now, we have to be cautious about that. We have unpublished data that, in my hands, I could uh, decrease my drilling time by almost 50%. But that was not true for the other neurotologists in our team. So I think that uh, there are uh, learning curves with the um, with the exoscope uh, that uh, in, in a level of comfort. The, uh, the definition of the exoscopic visualization is very good uh, up to a certain depth. But once you if you have extensive intradural dissection, the microscope is still provides the best visualization. Um, but but yeah, but that's that's why we did it, and that's you know for the most part, it's been a positive experience for us. Awesome, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. 
All right, Dr. Solaris. Well, um, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to talk about this important topic for us. Um, oh, thank you for having me. The pleasure. Uh, all right, we'll we'll sign off for now. Thanks again. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.